Jack, it's, uh, as Jack said, 10 years since, since I got by here the first time. I was actually about to go to sleep out on the interstate. And I decided it would be good to stop and get a cup of coffee. And there just has to be a McDonald's near a university somewhere. Students need it. Everybody should have a copy of this map. If you don't, we can get one for you very quickly. You will note this is a beautiful example of the cartographer's art. <laughs> uh, actually made many years ago by tracing the state lines from my son's US map puzzle. And it says map one, but don't worry about it, there is no map two. It's just when I start doing a tour or something somewhere, as I do frequently, I like to start with the big picture, sort of an introduction, and then work your way down. You know, map one, map two is maybe the state of Georgia. Map three is North Georgia. Map four is Whitfield County. Map five is the Dalton area. Map six is Mill Creek Gap. Map seven is Doug Gap. Map eight, map eight is Snake Creek Gap. You know, right down to the minute thing. But if I have a quarrel with the Civil War business, it's because people start off too often with the minutia and they don't really put things in context. And that's what I like to try to do for folks. And I think you'll find this map useful today. I will make reference to it from time to time as we go along. What I want to do today is to consider what I believe to be one of the three significant questions about the study of the Civil War. Actually, I believe there are three significant questions about the study of any war for most people. Now you can go out who hid behind this tree at 3.36 on the afternoon of July 2nd, 1864, but that's not significant. The three significant questions. One, what caused the war? Or you might want to put it, who was fighting whom? And what were they fighting about? Second significant question, why did the side that win the war win it? Or why did the side that lose it, lose it? And third significant question, what were the results of the war? Well, in one afternoon, one 30 or 40 minute period in one afternoon, we don't have time to talk about all three of those questions. So I've decided I would talk about one of them. I'm not gonna talk about the causes of the war. I would like to, but I think that to understand the cause of the American Civil War, you have to begin with Aristotle in the fourth century BC. <clears throat> and if you start with Aristotle in 330 BC and have to work your way down to 1860 AD, you've really got to move fast. And this late in the afternoon, I'm not up to talking that fast. So we'll save the causes of the Civil War, or as I call it, how Aristotle caused the Civil War for some other day. The result of the Civil War I'm not going to talk about that either because the Civil War is still going on and it's a little hard to determine what the result's going to be. So we have to wait a while on that one. So I'm going to come back and talk about that middle question. Why did the side that win the war win it? Or why did the side that lose the war lose it? That's what I want to focus on today. And I also want to specify that what I'm going to talk about is the military result of the war only. I'm not going to talk about the bigger struggle that went on from 1820 to the present and is still going on. That, again, is too big for one afternoon. I'm going to focus on the military events 1861 to 1865. And there's no question what the military result of the war was. The Confederacy lost. The Union won. But I want to focus on why the Union won. I have a strange idea about the reason for the military outcome of the Civil War. I collect things. I collect postage stamps, which is one reason why I don't do email. The other reason is I can't. I have a friend tell me she was going to teach me how to use a computer. I said, Judy, you would have an easier time teaching an earthworm how to fly the space shuttle. <laughs> I collect postcards. I collect battleship memorabilia. I don't know why, but I'm fascinated by those ships. And 
it gives me kind of a strange feeling to walk through an airport or something wearing my USS West Virginia BB-48 hat. And somebody, somebody actually said this one time in the Nashville airport. Golly, I didn't know they'd reactivated the West Virginia. <laughs> Sir, she was cut up for scrap in 1948. <laughs> I collect railroad memorabilia. I collect newspaper headlines. See, I see an interesting headline, I clip it out and glue it on a poster board. My favorites, California town panicked by radioactive cat droppings. <laughs> Eccles County girls win in hog showings. Now you laugh, but I've been to Eccles County. Those hogs never had a chance. Snake loses battle with chainsaw. In the all-time greatest newspaper headline ever published, I got it out of a paper in Decatur, Alabama. Old men own Viagra. Storm Nevada brothels. There is a headline that will get you to read the story. And there's a wonderful quotation from one of the ladies in the establishment. She said, I dread next week. That's when they get their social security checks. <laughs> I thought about sending that to President Obama if he's still trying to find a way to stimulate the economy. But I also, you thought I'd gone crazy. See, I also collect reasons why the Confederacy lost the Civil War. The Confederacy, not the South, the Confederacy. Why did the Confederacy lose the Civil War? I have 84 reasons why the Confederacy lost the Civil War. Because somebody writes a book about the Civil War and decides, well, I need to say something important. I've written a book about Civil War navies. I'll say the Confederacy lost the Civil War because of Union naval superiority. Somebody else writes a book about economic history. I'll say the Confederacy lost the war because of Northern industrial strength. Or somebody says the Confederacy lost the war because the North had more people. And it goes on and on for these 84 reasons. The problem is that some of those 84 reasons contradict others. A lot of them applied to the North as well as they applied to the South. And a number of them did not begin to have an effect until the military outcome of the war had been decided. In other words, the 84 reasons are all wrong. I know why the Confederacy lost the Civil War. And this afternoon, I'm going to tell you, and you will be part of a small but elite group of people who know why the Confederacy lost the Civil War. I know because one day I was out jogging in the Carolina Pines neighborhood of Raleigh and I had what I call my Saul on the road to Damascus experience. You remember the biblical story? Saul was going to Damascus one day to barbecue some Christians. And suddenly there was a blinding flash of light in the sky. And this voice said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And Saul said, <coughs> and converted to Christianity on the spot. And the rest, as they say, is history. I was jogging in Carolina Pines and there was a blinding flash of light in the sky and this voice said, listen up. I'm going to tell you why the Confederacy lost the Civil War. The voice said, the Confederacy lost the Civil War. Now, hold on, this is going to surprise you. Because the Confederate armies lost the battles. Now this had escaped historians' attention for 120 years because most historians don't like military history. But to understand that, you've got to take the whole Civil War and put it in a new framework. And that's what I want to try to do this afternoon, is offer a new framework of trying to understand the military, underlying military history of the Civil War. Because most people view it in what I call the old framework. And what I want to do is try to bring about a paradigm shift, as they call it. 
what is a paradigm shift. Let me give you an example. The classic paradigm shift. One day, the admiral, I knew I had it there somewhere, the admiral was sailing along in his great warship, and they came to him, and they said, Admiral, Admiral, we're in a fog. There's another ship up ahead. We see the light. We're going to collide. And the admiral rushed out on deck, and sure enough, off in the fog, he could see this light on another ship. And so he had his signalman blink out a message, change your course 20 degrees to starboard so we won't collide. Back came the reply, change your course 20 degrees to starboard so we won't collide. The admiral was not used to this, <clears throat> so he had his signalman blink out a second message. Change your course 20 degrees to starboard. I am an admiral. Back came the response. Change your course 20 degrees to starboard. I am a seaman second class. <laughs> now the admiral was furious. He had his signalman blink out a third message. Change your course 20 degrees to starboard. You better do it. So this is a great battleship. And back came the response, change your course 20 degrees to starboard. You better do it. This is a small lighthouse. <laughs> At that moment, the admiral had a paradigm shift. He saw things differently. And that's what I want to try to do this afternoon. Give you a different way to look at Civil War military history. Most people, when they consider the Civil War, think in terms of what I call the Virginia paradigm. They think about the Civil War as concentrated in the state of Virginia. That's all they think about. That's all they know about. Some people don't even know there is dry land west of the Appalachian Mountains. They focus so narrowly on Virginia. I know people who don't think there's dry land west of the Blue Ridge. They focus right on Virginia the Virginia paradigm. They suffered from what I call the Virginia disease, <clears throat> VD for short. <clears throat> if you've got the VD, all you do is think about the Civil War in Virginia. And if you think only about the Civil War in Virginia, you get a very wrong impression of the military history of the Civil War because the Confederacy did not lose the Civil War in Virginia. In fact, it came very close to winning it in Virginia on several occasions. So the Virginia disease, the Virginia paradigm, leads you astray. It leads you to focus on the war in Virginia. And the truth of the matter is that the war in Virginia was a stalemate. Neither side could win, neither side could lose in Virginia. The Union Army was too, too big, too strong to lose, but not smart enough to win. And the Confederate Army in Virginia was too small and too weak to win, but as long as Robert E. Lee was alive, he was too smart to lose. And I tell my friends from north of the Mason-Dixon line or the Ohio River, that if the war had been limited to Virginia, it would still be going on. People in Ohio and Pennsylvania would be saying, golly, I hope we can beat Lee this summer. And yeah, that old man's been beating up on us for 163, 53 years now. I thought Ike had him back in 45 with that atomic bomb. I don't know how he got out of that one. But fortunately, Fortunately, the war was not limited to Virginia. It was not in Virginia that the military outcome of the war was decided. It was decided elsewhere. And that is this map, the purpose of this map that I gave you. Unlike a lot of Civil War maps, this one is centered on the most important military point in North America. It's number 12 on that map, Cairo, Illinois, and it is Cairo, it is not Cairo, it is not Cairo, it is Cairo, Illinois, right at the southernmost tip of Illinois. 
south of Richmond, south of Louisville, at the very point of Illinois, which is shaped like the blade of a dagger stabbed into the heart of the Confederacy, which is exactly what it was. No less a person than William Tecumseh Sherman said, whoever controls the junction of the Ohio and Mississippi rivers will control North America. And he was right in the period before air power. You can go there today to Cairo, down right down literally to that point of land. And you're standing there, you've got the Ohio River fed by the Tennessee coming in from your left. You've got the Mississippi River fed by the Missouri coming in from your right. And they come together at Cairo and they flow south for a thousand miles to the Gulf of Mexico, right down the middle of the Confederacy. It's the one place where you can stand with one foot in Mississippi River mud and the other foot in Ohio River mud. And a few years ago, there was a tour group there, and the guide told them, this is the one place where you can do that. And one woman decided she wanted to do it. She walked out into the water and promptly sank up to here in the mud. The group pulled her out, dripping Mississippi mud off one side, Ohio River mud off the other side. The question was what to do with her, because the group was 85 miles from the motel, still had three or four hours of Civil War touring to do, and you didn't want to get mud all over the bus. Fortunately, the bus driver had one of those big orange plastic trash sacks. So you punch four holes in it, one for each foot, one for each hand, pull the drawstring around her neck, and she spent the rest of the day looking like either the great pumpkin risen up out of the pumpkin patch, or like Phil Fulmer, if you're a football fan and remember University of Tennessee football coach Phil Fulmer, when he would come out in that orange and white University of Tennessee jacket. Whoever controls Cairo, Illinois, will control North America. Civil War was divided into three great geographical areas. Way over here in the west, way over in the west, west of the Mississippi, what was called the Trans-Mississippi. Not that important in a military point of view, the only militarily important, significant events out there concerned the struggle for possession of Missouri, which boiled down to St. Louis. And the federal government won that in the very early weeks of the war. And after that, what happened west of the Mississippi was not that important. Second area is over east of the Appalachian Mountains. That area in Virginia, Maryland, southern Pennsylvania, northeastern North Carolina. The Virginia Theater. Stalemate. As I said, neither side could win there. The area where the war was decided was in the middle. Between the Appalachian Mountains over here on the east and the Mississippi River over here on the west. Kentucky, Tennessee, Mississippi. Alabama, Georgia, an area known in the 1860s as the West. That is where the battles took place that decided the outcome of the Civil War. That's the new paradigm, the new framework that I would like to suggest for you. That it is in the battles out there that the Confederacy lost the Civil War. And if you accept that new paradigm, then it is possible, I think, to get a realistic answer to a number of questions that have bedeviled Civil War historians for a long time. Take, for example, that question which I already mentioned. Why did the Confederacy lose the war? It lost the battles. What battles did it lose? It didn't lose many battles in Virginia. It lost battles in Kentucky. Tennessee, Mississippi, and Georgia. Those were the battles that determined the outcome of the war. And the question naturally arises if the Confederacy could win battles in Virginia, why couldn't it win battles 
in the West? And I would suggest there are really two answers to that. One of them is the geography of the West, specifically the rivers. If you look at the rivers on that map, the ones that are in heavy black ink, the Mississippi, the Ohio, the Tennessee, the Cumberland, the Red River. They divided the Confederacy in half, the Mississippi did. The Cumberland and the Tennessee opened up a route of invasion into the Confederate heartland. And it was the struggle for those rivers that determined the military outcome of the war in its early years. Those are the battles to look at. Fort Henry, Fort Donelson on the Tennessee and Cumberland rivers, Shiloh, Vicksburg in 1863. All of those are the ones that led to the defeat of the Confederacy on the battlefield. The geography, the rivers. There are wonderful studies of these rivers that have been made. Some of them relating only to the Civil War, some of them relating to the Civil War as part of this larger study of the river. If you have not read it, I highly recommend a book by John Barry called Rising Tide. I read it because I thought it was about University of Alabama football. But I got about to page 350 and there had been no mention of my hero, Bear Bryant. So I went back and looked and it was actually about the great Mississippi River flood of 1927. But in the course of that, he went back and explained a lot about the history, the geology, the geography, the hydrology of the river. Rising Tide by John Barry. It's, it's a wonderful read, even if it had nothing to do with the Civil War. But it gives you a lot of information on the Civil War and about people who were so involved in the war on the rivers. One of the key people, for example, very few people in America have heard of him, James Buchanan Eads, E-A-D-S. Name ring a bell? The Eads Bridge at St. Louis. Eads was a self-made, self-taught river man in the 1840s and 50s. Made a fortune salvaging steamboats out of the western rivers. At the beginning of the Civil War, the Lincoln administration called him to Washington. It was one of those things that you associate with the government. Eads, you know anything about naval warfare? No. You know anything about building naval gunboats and warships? No. You have any facilities to build gunboats? No. Great, you got a contract to build six gunboats for the federal government. We want them built in 90 days. He didn't make it. But he had seven in 120 days. And as they say, that's close enough for government work. <laughs> Ironclad gunboats. The Confederacy had no defense against them. And they essentially ripped apart those rivers in 1862 and 1863. Split the Confederacy in half. Were instrumental in giving the federal armies control of Kentucky, most of Tennessee, much of Mississippi, areas that were the key food producing, horse producing, cattle producing, hog producing, wheat producing areas of the Confederacy. All from the gunboats. <coughs> Second reason why I think the Confederates wound up losing the battles <coughs> and the war in the West was the poor quality of Confederate generals in the West. We don't have an opportunity or a chance or time this afternoon to get into all of this, but let me give you one example who sort of set the tone for everything else. Gideon J. Pillow from Tennessee. Pillow was a political crony of President James K. Polk in the 1830s and 40s. Polk made him a general in the Mexican War. Pillow had been wounded in the Mexican War, but in the course of his service there, he had demonstrated, first off, 
a great tendency to quarrel and argue with other people. And that became a characteristic of the Confederate war effort in the West. Second, Pillow had demonstrated a great inability to do things in a military sense. He is famous for having his men dig a trench in the Mexican War and pile the dirt behind them. This is not the mark of a great military engineer. At the very beginning of the Civil War, he was the major general commanding the Tennessee State Militia. And he was the first man they put in charge of defending these western rivers. And he made a total mess of it. He specifically ignored the middle part of Tennessee, the Cumberland and Tennessee rivers largely. He fortified Memphis by putting guns right on the very edge of the bluff over the Mississippi till somebody told him, hey, Pillow, all a Union ship has to do is fire a couple of shells into the bluff below those guns and all your fortifications will collapse into the river. Oops, I never thought of that. But my favorite story about Pillow was when a Confederate newspaper wanted to call him a battle-scarred veteran of the Mexican War. And owing to a typographical error, it came out he was a bottle-scarred veteran <laughs> of the Mexican War. So the next issue, the paper corrected that and announced he was a battle-scared veteran <laughs> of the Mexican War. He was very unhappy when he was superseded by a general who, if anything, was even more pompous and useless than he was, Leonidas Polk. I used to call him Leonidas, but I have a friend who has a friend who has a wife who is a direct descendant of the general, and she told him who told him who told me that the family pronounces it Leonidas. So Leonidas it is. Graduated from West Point, 1827 immediately resigned from the army, went into the Episcopal clergy. Beginning of the Civil War was the Episcopal Bishop of Louisiana. Very prominent man, very important in the educational history of the South. Founding father of the University of the South at Suwannee, Tennessee. But Jefferson Davis made him a major general in the Confederate Army in the summer of 1861, which made him senior that is outranking just about everybody in the Confederate Army and sent him out to take command from Pillow, who was unhappy about being superseded. And Pillow and Polk came up with the idea that they would seize Columbus, Kentucky. And I'm going to talk about Columbus later. And that, that's, I believe that's the point where the war turned against the Confederacy and they were never able to reverse it. Pillow was the first of many who spent time squabbling and arguing with each other and leading to almost consistent defeat of the Confederate armies in the West. It was those defeats that determined the outcome of the war. So if you adopt this new paradigm, you look at these battles in the West as determining the outcome of the war, not at the battles in Virginia Maryland, and Pennsylvania. A second new way of looking at things that the Western paradigm will give you is the question of the turning point. That's a favorite term among historians and among journalists. The turning point. I have in my newspaper clipping collection an article from the Atlanta paper in which a reporter began an article about a monument on the island of Okinawa, World War II, to Japanese and American dead. In the battle, wrote the reporter, where the Pacific War turned against the Japanese. Now, Okinawa was in April 1945. The war had turned against the Japanese three years earlier. If Okinawa had turned anything, the Japanese would have won the war. It simply continued this string of defeats that the Japanese suffered. Turning point, turning point, turning point, turning point. I have here an illustration of turning points for you because I'm big on definitions. If you're going to use a 
expression like turning point, I think you need to describe it. Give people some idea. These, tell, tell me this is not high-tech modern instructional media. <laughs> These lines represent turning points with one exception on each chart. Three turning points and one line that is not a turning point. I suggest that the line that is not a turning point is the true line representing military history in the Civil War. That the Civil War turned against the Confederates at almost the very beginning. And it was all downhill from there. What was it that brought about that turning point? It was Kentucky. Look at Kentucky on your map. Kentucky is in the middle between north and south. It's in the middle between east and west. It was in the middle between the Confederacy and the federal government during the Civil War. The people in Kentucky, the older residents, had come from Virginia, the Carolinas, Tennessee, and Georgia. Their children and grandchildren who left the state went on to Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota, was demographically in the middle between North and was economically in the middle. Traditionally, Kentucky's products had gone to market down the Cumberland, Tennessee, Ohio, and Mississippi rivers to New Orleans. Wheat, corn, in either solid or liquid form, depending on what they did with it before they shipped it off, wound up going down river to market. But by the time of the Civil War, railroads had reached the Ohio River, and they were beginning to divert Kentucky products to the east, directly to Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York. Kentucky was economically in the middle. Jefferson Davis and Abraham Lincoln were both from Kentucky. Davis had left the state and gone south. Lincoln had left the state and gone north. John Crittenden, who succeeded Henry Clay in the Senate from Kentucky, had two sons who were major generals in the Civil War. One was in the Union Army, one was in the Confederate Army. The state was divided. The people of Kentucky were pro-slavery, but they were anti-secession. The governor was a secessionist, the legislature was unionist. What do you do? You declare neutrality. This is nonsense. This is Belgium being neutral in a war between France and Germany. This is Texas being neutral in a war between the United States and Mexico. It ain't going to happen. This is Kentucky being neutral in a war between the United States and the Confederate States. But Kentucky was so important that both the United States and the Confederate States said, we'll respect your neutrality. And both Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis promised to do so. And immediately both of them went to work trying to undermine it. Lincoln was subject to terrific pressure from the anti-slavery people in the North. But Lincoln knew that if he moved against slavery too fast and too soon, he would push Kentucky into the Confederacy. And there's a story that may or may not be apocryphal that a group of abolitionist preachers told him at the beginning of the war, Mr. President, if you act to abolish slavery, you will have God on your side. And Lincoln is supposed to have replied, Gentlemen, I would like to have God on my side, but I have got to have Kentucky. Good day. And showed them out of the White House. But Leonidas Polk and Gideon J. Pillow, scheming to defend the Mississippi River, we want high ground where we can put big guns to keep Union vessels from using the Mississippi River. The northernmost high ground in the Confederacy that was usable for that purpose was Memphis, Tennessee. Look at where Memphis is on the map. It's way down at the southern border of Tennessee. Now there is high ground along the Mississippi north of Memphis, but it doesn't have a railroad. You're talking about guns that weigh 30 or 40,000 pounds. And you don't just get three guys together and say, all right, let's carry this thing, you know, 50 miles to the Mississippi River. You need a railroad. Memphis had a railroad. The next point north of Memphis 
where a railroad touched the Mississippi River was Columbus, Kentucky. Ah, said Pillow and Polk, if we seize Columbus, we've got high ground, we've got a railroad, we can close the river. Too bad Kentucky is neutral. Into Kentucky they go. Immediately, Ulysses S. Grant, commanding Union forces in southern Illinois, pounced and seized Paducah, Kentucky, at the mouth of the Tennessee. And with Paducah in Union hands, the Confederates could not stay in Columbus because federal troops could move up the Tennessee River on a river, if you don't know, you probably do since you're on one, but there are only four directions, up and down and left and right. North, south, east and west are irrelevant. Move up the Tennessee River, against the flow of the river. And when federal troops did that, they could cut off Polk's people at Columbus in that cul-de-sac of the Tennessee, Ohio, and Mississippi rivers. Polk seized ground that he could not keep, and in doing so, he gave the federal army the excuse to come into Kentucky. He pushed the legislature in Kentucky into declaring for the Union, and boom, that, I suggest, is the turning point of the war. Because the whole history of the war from that time on is trying to undo the damage that Polk had done. But Polk wasn't through. Uh, he went on for the next almost three years, stabbing his commanding general in the back, refusing to obey orders, criticizing him, trying to get him removed, until finally in June 1864, when, as my graduate school mentor, Bell Wiley, said, he was perforated by a hostile cannonball. His career came to an end. But the evil which men do lives on after them. And the seed of discontent in argument, in refusal to obey orders, in incompetence that Polk and Pillow had put into that army to start with, went right on from that time. <clears throat> We're beginning to run out of time, but let me just suggest one other very quick matter about a topic that comes up in the war. What about the decisive battle? By one count, there were 2,261 battles in the Civil War. Eventually, we will have a book about every one of them. We may have 500 books about every one of them, like we do on Gettysburg. You know, they come out, they just pour out. I have a friend who told me one time, he, had, he, he writes book reviews and stuff and for the History Book Club, said he'd gotten seven books on Gettysburg that year. And I said, Jack, it's Thanksgiving. You've got another five or six weeks to go. <laughs> and sure enough, he told me in the new year, he said, you know, I got another book on Gettysburg between Thanksgiving and Christmas. You know, the struggle for the northwest side of Little Round Top between 3.30 and 3.34 p.m. on the afternoon of July 2nd or the use of the bayonet by the left flank elements of Company E of the 6th Wisconsin Regiment, or the left-handed soldiers in the 43rd Mississippi fighting for the possession of this big rock. You know, there's just you know, 800 page studies like that just pouring out of the press. But Gettysburg is often said to be decisive. Michael, what did Gettysburg decide? Didn't decide. It decided the outcome of the Gettysburg campaign. It decided that Adams County, Pennsylvania would make money in the tour business. <laughs> and that's about it. A couple of years ago, there was a wonderful article in the magazine North and South, far and away the best of the Civil War magazines, in which the author was comparing Civil War military history to a football game. He said, Gettysburg was a goal line stand. It, the Confederates had won a great victory at Fredericksburg, Virginia the previous December. They won a great victory at Chancellorsville, Virginia in May. If they had followed that up with routing the Union Army at Gettysburg in July 1863, it might have really meant something. But they did not. You know, it, it's like a goal line stand. It does not win the game for you, but it can keep the other team from winning. That's what Gettysburg was. And the author of this article went on to compare various facets of the 
military history of the war to various things in football games. This was too much for a reader in California who wrote a letter to the editor. said, this article is disgraceful. It's simple-minded. It's stupid. Maybe he's writing about the author. Idiotic. Moronic. You know, only a fool would write an article. Actually, I thought I made some good points when I wrote that article. I mean, it was a fun article. But I think it had some truth to it. But the, po the point being that, that these battles in Virginia were not decisive. Neither side could get a winning streak going and keep it going long enough to mean anything. But in the West, the Union Army started winning the war at the very beginning with this loss of Kentucky. And it went right on winning battles in a virtually unbroken streak until the end of the war in 1865. The only major Confederate victory in the West was the Battle of Chickamauga. And having won the victory, the Confederate General Braxton Bragg and his subordinates didn't know what to do with it. You know, like the dog, the old joke about the dog that chased the car. Finally, he caught one, didn't know what to do with it. That was the case here. Confederate generals didn't know what to do with this battle that they had won. So they threw away some 18,000 Confederate casualties in that battle virtually unbroken string of defeat for the Confederates in the West. The whole war in the West was an attempt to undo the damage that Polk and Pillow had done in 1861 with the loss of Kentucky. We're running out of time, but I wanted to just try to show you some ways in which your perspective on the war will change if you look at the area between the Appalachians and the Mississippi River as the area where the military, underlined military outcome of the war had been decided. Because I think it was there and not at Gettysburg, not in Antietam, not in the East, that the military outcome of the war was decided. And it was there that the Union won or the Confederacy lost the military side of the war. But once the military had been side had been decided, the war went on. And as I said, it hasn't ended yet. So who knows what the final outcome will be. But at any rate, I hope I've given you something to think about and that this might pique your interest a bit get you to do some readings, some thinking about the war, and to realize how complex some of these things can be. Might also add they're fascinating, and if you're not a Civil War buff, I would warn you, the Civil War is contagious, and it is addictive. So you can get hooked on it very easily, and stay hooked on it for, old, for the rest of your life. But it's fun. It's fun. Okay. Any questions or comments? Good grief, yes. In, in your opinion, why did it take so long uh, for Lincoln to recognize Grant and Sherman and the generals that were winning in the West? Why did it take them so long to, to bring them to the East? And I think Lincoln had a bad case of the VD. <laughs> that he focused on Virginia. And I, in fact, in Sometimes I do a talk on Abraham Lincoln in the March of Folly. I don't know if you read Barbara Tuckman's great book, The March of Folly, about persistence in error. And I think the, the, the Union eventually won the war when Grant realized, I'm not going to win it in Virginia. Sherman, you win it out in Georgia, which is essentially what Sherman did in 1864. And I think that when Grant I think it was a mistake to bring Grant to Virginia. I think the war would have ended a lot sooner if Lincoln had kept Grant out in the West. Sherman thought that. You know, there's a wonderful letter he wrote to Grant in 1864 when Lincoln appointed him commander of all the Union forces. He said, don't stay in Virginia. Come out West. Sherman called it the seat of the coming empire. And he said, from the West, when our task is done, we will make short work 
of Richmond, Charleston, and the coast of the Atlantic, which is what they did. Yes? Well, but there you've got the idea that um, everybody was so intimidated by Lee. And Grant was a fellow who was not intimidated. He fought the same way that Lee did. He had the same kind of idea about war and armies and things that Lee did. And, you know, that, I think that, you know, everybody else who'd gone up against Lee just hadn't, I mean, yeah, they, maybe they got to stalemate, but maybe they were hoping, I assume they were hoping, that maybe Grant would have better luck because he was a much more aggressive. Well, you're, you're right. He was, and they were hoping he'd have better luck, but he didn't. No, um, You know, Grant, in, 18, in May and June of 1864 in Virginia, Grant lost somewhere in the neighborhood of 65 to 85,000 men. No American army has ever been beaten up like that anywhere, anytime. And... Lee was so secure that he sent off about a fourth of his army to the Shenandoah Valley, and they raided Washington, D.C. They burned Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. Um, Grant was bogged down at Petersburg, getting nowhere. His troops were refusing to make attacks uh, because they knew that they would not succeed. You know, I think the, the performance that Lee turned in in 1864 is probably the most incredible any American general has ever done. Here was a man who was 58 years old. 58? Yes, 58. I had to do my arithmetic there. Uh, 58 years old, suffering heart problems that would bring his death in a few years, sick for much of the time, and still uh, having to offset his subordinates who were being killed. You know, of, of his major subordinates in the Army that summer, one of them was badly wounded and out of service for six or eight months. One of them was mortally wounded and died. One of them was sick and incapacitated, and the other one went to pieces. And Lee took over the whole army, essentially doing everything, and managed to inflict casualties on Grant, to stalemate him, and to bog him down. You made the point so many of them were intimidated by Lee. Have you read Our Masters of Rebels? by Michael Adams. It's, it's a wonderful book about that very attitude on what people in the North thought about that. They would go out to play against Lee and it would be kind of, I mean, to fight against Lee and to go back to the football analogy. I don't know who Ohio State is playing in their first game next year, but I can tell you that whoever it is is worried. <laughs> Same thing is true for Alabama and Oregon and I hope Georgia Tech. Uh, you had a question? Yes. Uh, what was, do you think Davis's cul culpability was? He was such friends with Bragg and Polk and the worst of all of them, and they supported to the end. I think Davis bears a large share of the responsibility for the South, not because of that, but because he created a system in which only he could make a decision and he would not make a decision. He would say, send reinforcements if available. <laughs> I don't have any available. Send reinforcements if practicable. I don't have any, you know, it's not practicable to send them. And so they would get in these arguments and go on and on and on. And by the time Davis finally could bring himself to issue an order, it was too late. I think he bears a, a big burden of responsibility. There's a wonderful book on this called Two Great Rebel Armies, which is one of those books everybody should buy and read. Well, I don't care if you read it. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, folks. Well, as I say, I hope I've given you something to think about. Hope I'll see you this evening. Thank you very much.